Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit Live special, episode 192, recorded March the 11th, 2014. South by Southwest Interactive Wrap Up. Hi, I'm Tanya Hall, and welcome to South by Southwest Interactive Coverage Wrap Up Session. Uh, here with uh, on Twit TV, we get a couple of guests that are going to join us and talk about their experience at South by Southwest and what the big takeaways were. Um, South by Southwest continues with music and film, um, but our coverage is wrapping up today. Our first guest that we have joining us is Joseph Volpe. He is the senior editor at Engadget. Welcome to the show, Joseph. Thank you. Good morning, Tanya. And um, it is, is it the last day for you? Are you going to continue on there uh, for the film and the music portions as well? No, I'm out very early tomorrow morning, so I'm unfortunately going to miss all of the... So I've been told it becomes, you know, sort of chaotic and complete madness around here as soon as the music portion starts. I imagine. It, I th you know, and it's from all of the... I've seen on social media, the tweets, the Facebook, it seems like it's actually gotten a little bit crazy already. Oh, yeah, I mean, definitely. Everywhere I've gone, there have been endless lines. Um, it helps to be on the VIP RSVP list, but then again... You know, that doesn't even work out. Um, Lady Gaga was at the Vice Party uh, last night. I think she was in a riser next to me. I couldn't really tell. Uh, but, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely been madness. A lot of interest here this year. Now, okay, so I have to ask, um, did you get a chance to see the Oreo cookie that everybody's talking about? I didn't. One of my uh, One of my colleagues actually went to go do that. I really had wanted to. Then you probably didn't also sit on the wrecking ball. No, no. But Joseph. I, I, I feel as though someone from my company already did that and made enough headlines for it. So. Well, okay. So let's get to the real stories. Um, sure. Edward Snowden uh, yesterday um, hits all over the news, this big conversation yeah. around privacy. The first time I think that we've heard from Edward Snowden, um, at, certainly in his words, uh, since uh, he disappeared. Right. What do you think this was big news? I mean, it's people are talking about it, but did anything really revolutionary come out of that? Conversation? Not, not, you know, not at all. In fact, I think a lot of us, uh, a lot of my colleagues that were here, I was at the, uh, I was at the talk with uh, Terrence O'Brien from my staff, and you know, we were both saying he didn't really say anything new. There was nothing revelatory. I think it was mostly the interesting thing was that he he chose to speak to the audience at South by Southwest Interactive. So instead of going to the policy makers, you know, he came here to the tech community, and you know, it's interesting because it, it's sort of reaching out, obviously, to a crowd who I think for the most part. Uh, believes in what he's done uh, and applauds it, and you know, sort of, you know, these startups are enabled in a way to to help sort of promote the things that he wants to see, which is end-to-end -end encryption, um, you know, uh, better tools in terms of uh, like PGP, Tor, making those more user-friendly um, because they aren't now because you know the the average user can't connect to stuff like that uh, to to sort of safeguard their data as it crosses the the internet. You know, we've got a a little clip from yesterday where, um, again, it, the audio was terrible. not so great. It was really <laughs> terrible. You think at a tech event, this would have gone off a little bit better, but let's go to the clip. Okay. The NSA, the sort of global mass surveillance that's occurring in all of these countries, not just the U.S., and it's important to remember that this is a global issue, they're setting fire to the future of the Internet. And the people who are in this room now you guys are all the firefighters, and we need you to help us fix this. So it's really what he's saying is he's kind of reaching out to the tech community and saying, okay, it's your responsibility to make this revolutionary change. But really, what can what can we do? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's really a political issue, right? I would say so. I mean, aside from creating different, like, you know, uh, peer-to-peer -peer technologies or, or, you know, different chat clients that are protected, you know, on the back end. I, I'm not really sure what we can do without our, our government itself uh, putting in the proper checks and balances to take care of these things. I mean, he made a really great point, which was we spent a lot of time being very defensive in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, very offensive instead of 
defensive. So, you know, we have all these uh, vulnerabilities um, and we've, we're leaving ourselves, you know, wide open for attacks. So, you know, I agree with him for the most part on, on those issues. But, you know, then again, I want my government to, uh, to protect me and to protect my country. So I'm torn. <laughs> you know, that's and I, I, I think I think that's a really good way to put it, because although he is going to go down in history as being someone who brought up this conversation and is 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 causing a, a lot of uh, big tech companies to put some things into place that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. At the same time, is he really a hero? And I think certainly um, it, it sounds like most of the tech community is touting him as being a hero when you read most of the stories and uh, news coming from South by Southwest. Yes, absolutely. I would definitely think so. I mean, what, what he's done is great. I would never want to be in his position. I mean, he appeared through seven proxies, <laughs> um, and I think that had to do with, with the connection issues. Um, you know, and he's basically living a life on the run. So, you know, he's done a great thing overall. <clears throat> I just hope that we don't become complacent uh, at the same time and sort of just, you know, as we were saying before, leave it up to, to you know, policymakers to take care of it. You know, we sort of have to keep, you know, poking them and reminding them that, you know, uh, we, we need our, our privacy protected, you know, um, and we need to make sure that our communications are secure. What other big conversations are you seeing happen? Of course, you know, Chelsea Clinton is speaking today. I'm sure she had the, as I said before, the government stamp of approval to talk about health care. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson is there. There's certainly a lot of conversation around marketing, which we're going to get to here in a minute. Right. But what, what are you seeing? What's anything really big coming out of this? Any new apps or conversation? You know, I don't think there's any one big um, general trend I'm seeing. I think it was really great. I was at the conversation with Sundar Pichai uh, of Google where, you know, they sort of let slip that uh, they're releasing uh, a new uh, wearable SDK for Android in the uh, next two weeks, which is, a, which is a pretty big deal because, you know, Android right now, very dominant uh, in the smartphone uh, space because it's, it's free and it's open source. Uh, but you're seeing, you know, industry giants like Samsung uh, who has been very, very dependent uh, on Android and very, very helpful in sort of promoting Android forward, now reversing course and saying, well, for our wearables, for our smartwatches, we're going with Tizen, which is uh, an operating system we've sort of co-developed with Intel. Um, you know, and that removes Google from a very valuable space, which is only going to get bigger, bigger, um, and become, you know, commonplace amongst average users. So uh, I think that, for me, at least from my perspective uh, and what I report on, that was uh, significant news. Does it matter to be at the event? I mean, there's a lot that you can see online. Um, we're, we're, cl we're clearly not at the event, but yet we're covering <laughs> it. How important is the South by Southwest interactive piece versus maybe where it was when it launched in over, even over the last few years? Yeah, you know, uh, there, was, there was a lot of debate uh, about that with my team where a couple of these big talks like uh, Julian Assange and uh, Snowden uh, were being live streamed, you know, making us wonder, like, should we even bother waiting on these tremendously long lines to get in and then go sit at the top of an auditorium um, and then, you know, be enable, uh, unable to, you know, hear the audio. Um, I do think, though, that it's good to, to be there live in person because there, there are hiccups with streams. We've seen this before. I mean, I covered E3 last year. Uh, Nintendo did a stream, and there were such issues on the, the server end that um, we relate to the news. So... You know, I do think it's good to be on the ground uh, here. Um, you know, I wound up having a sort of one-on-one -on -one chat with um, the CEO of Aereo the other day. So, you know, something like that wouldn't happen uh, if I was just, you know, sitting back at home in New York um, trying to, to cover the show remotely. Good point. Good point. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out to join us this morning. Mm -hmm. And um, I know you're uh, getting over the, um, I think they call it the South by Southwest bird flu or what is it? What is it? They, uh, what do they call it every year? <laughs> I think it's too much whiskey. Too much. That? <laughs> that's, a, that's not a bad problem to have. Thanks no, again. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us. And if somebody wants to follow your work, they want to follow you at Engadget, what's the best way they can do that, Joseph? Uh, I'm on Twitter at J.R. Volpe, V-O-L-P-E. Um, a lot of uh, nonsensical tweets. So if you enjoy whimsy, you can follow me there. <laughs> will do. Will do. Thanks again and uh, feel better. Thank you so much, Tanya. Have a good day. Absolutely. Interesting conversations around Snowden. I have a few mixed feelings about it myself. Um, I definitely think he started a conversation that um, 
that, you know, is uh, important to have. But at the same time, is he really a hero? Okay, our next guest, Tim Hayden, is going to join us. I've known Tim for a long time. Tim Hayden is the principal strategist at TTH Strategy. In his talk, um, he's actually a speaker and a presenter at South by Southwest and a really incredible marketer. Welcome, Tim. Thanks, Thanks for joining us this morning. Howdy, Tanya. Thanks for having me. Howdy is the appropriate uh, hello from South by Southwest. Are you wearing your boots? I'm not today. It's going to be 80, what? so I'm in my flip-flops. 80 yeah. degrees? No, that it. sounds like Texas. Is it raining, though? Hopefully it's not raining. No, it's not. We got a little bit out over the last couple of days. Uh, we need it here, so uh, no, but it's it's going to be a nice, bright, sunny day today. Bright, sunny day. Well, you know, okay, so you're presenting at South by Southwest, I think, it, and... Um, is that today? What, what, what day? Did you already speak? I did. At, Saturday. Uh, at, at 11 a.m. on Saturday, I went head-to-head -head with Julian Assange uh, with a panel that talked about <laughs> responsive design. Your, um, to explain to our listeners, what is responsive design? Well, you know, marketers today are all up in arms about the omni-channel. Uh, you have uh, customers. You have the market, as it were who is increasingly carrying more devices of various form factors, phones, tablets, computers. Um, earlier this week, uh, or last week, pardon me, Apple launched CarPlay. Uh, I mean, it means that we're all of a sudden going to have more connectivity in our cars. Uh, what does it mean for web content to get to these various devices? And the current buzzword, the current thing we're talking about is responsive design, meaning that websites and, and web content will get to those devices without any problems, performance issues. So your 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 speech, uh, your uh, conversation is from every screen to no screen. What does that exactly mean? Well, I think the thing is, is is as you see what's happened with the explosion in uh, both both smartphones, tablets, and wearable technology. As what's happening right now. We as a, as a species, you know, and I will get anthropological with you, we're going lighter and lighter. Our screens are getting smaller. And, um, you know, I think a lot of us believe that ultimately there will be something that whether it's a ring, it's a watch, it's something we wear, uh, no matter where we go, we won't be staring at that device. Um, we'll have voice. We'll have uh, other types of input and output that allow us to compute without having to look at a screen or even use a typewriter as we know it today. How is that really the impact for marketers? As consumers, we're obviously, I mean, I've got two screens in front of me right now, not to mention every other screen in the studio, but I typically have my mobile device or some other type of, in some other type of computing device um, as I'm going throughout my day, whether it's a TV or a monitor. How is marketers, is that really changing? And and I know that's a big part of the conversation you've had. You focused on mobile a lot in the past. And now with Google Glass, you know, our, our host Mike is big on wearing his uh, glasses. But, you know, as marketers, does that really change our strategy? You know, at, at the end of the day, no. I, I think um, uh, it, it doesn't change what we're trying to do to use content, to use compelling messaging and, and, and design to to drive some type of purchase behavior, some type of brand championing or evangelism. I don't think that game has changed. What has changed, though, is the way we have to go about understanding the person and their behavior. Uh, it's no longer a game simply about media. Uh, it is not simply about channels. It's about understanding who people are. And I, I say this often. If you ever watch Mad Men and you watch how they bring a psychologist or a sociologist into a creative session, uh, we're back to that again, where we start to understand the day in the life of our audience, of, of the people we want to sell to, the people we want to market to. Uh, and I think that's that has changed drastically over the last four or five years. You and I have had this conversation um, off camera about this evolution of small marketing agencies, the small agency versus the big giant, um, you know, Lots of big agencies are out South by Southwest. You've got Edelman Digital. You've got W2O Group. And and they're they're having to change the way that they look at business, whether it's public relations or advertising, and really think differently about the types of marketing they've done. You're seeing, and I am as well, the surgence of the small agency, and you have a lot of them at South by Southwest. How 
t talk about that for a second. Is is it is it going to be that the small agency takes over the business of the big agency? Uh, I I do believe in many cases that that will be the situation. I think um, we're 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 looking at a situation where more and more media is going owned. And I mean by that, if you're a large brand and you have an app, you have a website, and you communicate with your customers via email, through direct mail, um, through text messaging, perhaps, these are increasingly tools that you can have in-house. And the way the data is flowing through some of those channels, uh, the agency really gets in the way many times. Uh, the agency uh, maybe creates a roadblock, and I think the bigger agencies are having to rethink what they do from a media strategy, media planning standpoint, and understanding even better what real-time analytics and real-time insights from these 24-7 channels, now that a phone goes with us everywhere while we're awake, um, I think that that changes the role of the agency. And the, the smaller they are, the more agile they can probably be, and not so much a, um, I, I, I don't mean it any other way, that is negative, a, a bottleneck or a roadblock to the end solution that an agency is providing to a brand. You know, Tim, I, you know, I think you're a great strategist. I'm excited to see that you started your own agency. And I'd love to ha talk more. If somebody wants to follow you or connect with you on this multi-screen topic or mobile or anything else, how can they do that? Well, I'm on the Twitters at <laughs> the Tim Hayden. Uh, that's uh, T-H-E-T-I-M-H-A-Y-D-E-N and uh, at tthstrategy.com and timhayden.com. A couple of different ways that I'm uh, sharing content every day. Great, Tim. Thanks again for taking time out and um, go put on your hat and go kick it with some other South by Southwest attendees. Thanks for having me, Tanya. Absolutely. That was Tim Hayden, really smart guy. He's been, he's actually worked for Edelman Digital. He's worked for big agencies and he's got his own agency that he's started up. And uh, I think if you are interested in marketing, he'd be a great person to follow. And finally, we've got Hugh back with us this morning. Hugh, who um, is the um, director, he is the South by Southwest Interactive Director, Hugh Forrest. Thanks for joining us again on the show and uh, helping us with this wrap up session. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry that I am uh, <laughs> challenged in the time zones. No worries. No worries. I'm, I'm, I think I'm core challenged here. Um, so, okay. Um, it's, it's kind of wrapping up the interactive part of the event. I know Chelsea Clinton speaking today, so there's still a lot happening, but, and you're getting into the kind of music and film arena. What, what was the biggest development at South by Southwest? <clears throat> well, certainly the most newsworthy thing that came out of this year's event was the, <sighs> Snowden talk yesterday, um, and uh, I've had a lot of people ask, well, does that mean that, that privacy and security is the online privacy and security and surveillance are the, are the big, is the biggest topic at this year's event? I'm not sure that that's quite accurate. It's one of the big topics, but certainly there's also a lot of uh, focus on wearables, a lot of focus on this next generation of, of hardware, 3D printing. Um, you know, we've done more sports this year than ever before. Uh, social media continues to be a big theme at this year's event. For your previous guests, a lot of agency presence here and, and understanding how brands can incorporate all this stuff. So, again, what we specialize in or try to specialize in is, is providing a very large platform where you can find all kinds of different content that can suit all kinds of digital creatives. You, you mentioned sports is a big part of the conversation. I think that um, we haven't seen a lot of that in the past. Um, tell us, what was a big takeaway from the conversation around sports and tech? Well, I think that, uh, I mean, we've had a little bit of this in the past, a lot more this year. And I think a lot of the issues in the sports world are similar to issues that we face or that, that other aspects of uh uh, the other aspects of the event. I mean, big data is certainly having a big impact or having a large impact on how we digest sports. Sports is more and more consumed on two or three different screens, social media. Certainly there's there are people in the sports world who are doing some very innovative things with social media. So again, these are topics and themes that are important to the sports world, but they're also important to other kinds of businesses that congregate in Austin in March. You know, one of the things that um, I've been curious about and I think, you know, is a big conversation in the social media space is that I think like the NFL, for example, have they really haven't 
and, and I would say sports in general, I don't want to pick on just one um, organization, but th they really haven't capitalized on the opportunity that they have to connect with fans. Like you see in some other industries like music, for example, where you've seen a, a lot of growth in the social space. W why is it that sports is kind of late to the game, if you will? Well, I, I think that uh, – <laughs> Sports may be late to the game. They're they're trying to catch up quickly, as are a lot of businesses that are late to the game. I think one of the reasons uh, sports is is maybe a little bit delayed is, is is sports is you know so much tradition based, and and this is the way we've always done it, so we're not going to change. And, and uh, you know um, the the people who come to South by Southwest are very much uh, against traditions and, and always looking for new ways to do things. So uh, I think there's some market opportunity there for us to grow, given the some of the entrenched ways of the sports world and some of the innovation that comes out of this event. Joseph Volpe joined us earlier on the show, and um, we had this discussion around um, the attending South by Southwest. And Every year, there's this controversy around, should we attend? Is it important? Can we cover it remotely? Can you know? Do we need to be there? And I thought it was really important that he actually said that you should attend South by Southwest, even though there's a lot you can do remotely. What would be your advice to people who are contemplating or maybe even trying to justify attending Southwest, South by Southwest to their employer um, as an expense? Because it is costly and time consuming. How would you justify, help them justify them? Well, yes, you can gain a lot of it out of the event simply by uh, participating virtually, watching live streams, watching the Twitter, uh, the Twitter sphere, watching or reading accounts and reports. I mean, there's certainly a lot to be gained that way. But um, I think attending the event is significantly more valuable simply because you can have face-to-face -face interactions with people at the event. And, um, you know, any successful conference event um, uh, gathering is all about face-to-face -face interactions. As much technology as we have, face-to-face -face interactions and, and meetings and connections are still the root of everything we do. And, and you simply can't do that quite as effectively in the virtual world. So coming to the event um, can give you, I think, a lot more value in, in the sense of who you meet, what you actually experience live and in person, and, and that gives you a little bit of an edge on people who only uh, experience it virtually. We, we talked about Snowden before, but I have to ask, did, did you guys get any grief from anyone uh, in the political space that... Um, you know, personally asked you not to, to air it or has given you grief since it's aired? Sure. There was the congressman from Kansas who sent a letter to us asking us to rescind the invitation. And there's certainly lots of uh, blog posts, emails, tweets out there about how could you uh, give a platform to this criminal? That's, um, that, that's not the right thing to be doing. Um, and, and that's great. I mean, uh, uh, they're, they're, not everyone has to agree with what we do. I think what was particularly good about the Snowden talk is it wasn't about whether he should be pardoned by Obama or whether he should have asylum or anything like that. It was a call to arms to the, or call to action to the tech world to build better encryption and use encryption. And it's a fairly simple message, but hearing it from someone who uh, is um, hidden in Moscow because of his actions makes it a lot more powerful. I think it was very meaningful to this audience. As someone putting on an event of this magnitude, it's huge, um, it, tons of attendees, tons of events, tons of sessions, and um, just trying to coordinate everything like that. How, how do you learn from year over year what you've done the year before? And how, how do you expect this is going to change for 2015? Well, we spend a, a long time uh, in the planning. I mean, it's a year-round event or a year-round cycle to plan for five days. Um, we think we do a lot of things right, but every year after the event, we got, get a lot of feedback that shows that there's still a lot of room for improvement and, and kind of try to incorporate that into what we do for the next year. Um, I always say, and I, I believe this firmly, that South by Southwest is a community event and the real juice of the event, the real power of the event comes from the community. So again, um, that community input on what we did right and what we did wrong is very valuable towards uh, planning and will be something that, that really uh, is incorporated into what we do from March 2015. Thank you for joining us. Okay, finally, 
the biggest takeaway that you think um, uh, that kind of surprised you this year with the event or that um, you think um, was the most powerful takeaway for South by Southwest Interactive? It's the most powerful takeaway. Well, it survived even though rain. Um, <laughs> apparently it never rains in Austin aside from South by Southwest. So that's a good takeaway. Um, uh, I, I think, again, as, as much um, uh, as much of an outcry is uh, there, there, as much as there is this uh, refrain from the community that the event has gotten too big, um, there's a much larger chorus in the community that's still getting a lot of value out of the event, still making connections, still finding new business opportunities, still finding lots and lots of great things to do at the event. So I'm psyched that uh, I think the future is still very bright for what we're doing here. Sounds great to me. And you know what? I'm putting together a case to try to be there next year. I really appreciate you joining us. And I'm challenging everyone at South by Southwest to try to get a picture of you riding the wrecking ball <laughs> <laughs> and Instagram that. Uh, send that to me at Twit. Thanks for joining us. If somebody wants to follow South by Southwest, follow you um, again, what's the best way they should do that, Hugh? Uh Two options there. First, the South by Southwest website, www.sxsw.com, and then on Twitter, just at SXSW. All righty. Thanks again for joining us. Enjoy and uh, relax. Have some fun. You told me last night you're not having, you're not able to have fun because you're so busy it's working. Not enough fun, but uh, <laughs> it's all good. Thanks again. Have a great event. That was Hugh Forrest, the South by Southwest Interactive Director. That's our wrap-up. Um, I think it's a very powerful event. It's all about innovation, and we'd love to hear from you. Follow us on Twitter at, at twit, that's T-W-I-T, or find me at, at Tanya Hall Radio. I'd love to get your feedback. Thanks again, and that's a wrap.